right. Hello, and welcome to Plugin Along, a stream dedicated to Lotro plugins. Looks like my audio is fixed. Let me know in the chat if I've got that wrong. Um, last time on Plugin Along, we added an option to the Minstrel Buff plugin to hide the war speech timers that we added a few times ago, just in case people don't like that. And then moved the new melodic interlude timer to a new window. So today we're going to add Court of Salvation and raise the spirit to the window, and if we have time, do some other cleanup stuff. We'll see. Also, today is the one year anniversary of Plugin Along. Woo! Today is stream number 50, and we of course started with stream number zero, and that's 51 streams. And one time I was bumped by Scenario, who uh, could only stream on Tuesday that week. So, uh, 52 weeks, and to celebrate, we'll do some uh, Literal Point giveaways during the stream. Uh, we'll probably start one of those in a little bit. Um, I wonder if I could do that. Hmm. Give away reset. All right. Give away open. Okay, okay. Well, if anyone happens to be here right now, feel free to toss an uh, exclamation point giveaway into chat. Uh, or if not uh, now, then we'll let that run for a little while. Cool, okay. So as always, feel free to jump into the chat with your thoughts and questions. But first, uh, I7 in chat uh, during Little Redhead stream mentioned that she'd been, uh, they've been trying to get uh, Titan Bar and D Tracker plugins working. So we're gonna see what that looks like using the Plugin Compendium desktop application. So let's go ahead and, oh, hello Goose. Excellent. Let's see, can I get that any closer? Nope, don't move. Oh well, yeah, there we go. Um, cool, so Lotro Plugin Compendium is an optional third party application that you can download from lotrointerface.com. Let's go ahead and pull it open actually. So pull up in a browser, lotrointerface.com. And if you search for Plugin Compendium, and that's important because there is a plugin called Compendium. That's not going to be as helpful in this case. And we're looking for the Lotro Plugin Compendium by Lunar Water. So this is a downloadable desktop application, and I believe there are versions for Linux and or Mac OS as well. And when you have downloaded this and run it, it will look like this. The uh, window will have three tabs in it, installed plugins, add new plugins, and configuration. So configuration, I've never had to mess with it. I don't know how smart it is, but it's going to ask, what is your plugin install path? And the answer is on your usual installation, there should be a folder in your documents folder called the Lord of the Rings online. Now, if you have a much older installation, uh, maybe that could be different. Uh, but I think usually the older installations uh, change where the program files installation is. Uh, so you're looking for in your uh, account, if you go to your documents folder, just in a normal browser, you're probably going to see the Lord of the Rings online. Sweet. In that folder, um, by default, the plugins folder will probably not be there if it's a fresh install. But if there is a plugins folder there, if you've manually created it, or if Lotro Plugin Compendium has done that for you, then uh, Lord of the Rings Online is going to look for plugins inside that folder. Cool. So uh, plugin downloads, uh, this is just where it's gonna store those things temporarily. Don't have to mess with that. And the plugin feed, if you wanted to use some other feed, you could do that, but uh, this all works out of the box. It's great. Uh, so installed plugins, uh, Lotro Plugin Compendium is also going to look in this plugins folder to take a look at uh, what plugins we have. Now, right now, I only have Minstrel Buffs installed, and Lotro Plugin Compendium knows that. Uh, but it also knows that there are a bunch of other plugins that I could install. And so um, the first one that I believe i7 mentioned was Titan Bar. Titan Bar is great. Let's go ahead and do a search. Now, if you look for this on lotrointerface.com, you will see there have been many things called Titan Bar. Uh, for instance, all of these. 
a handy thing to do is to sort this by the release date. By default, it's being sorted by a score, but if you come back in and instead click on date, uh, it's gonna start by doing an ascending sort, not the most helpful, but if you click that little arrow, you can reverse it and do a descending, most recent first. Uh, and we can see there was a patch for calc stat use, interesting, and we can see Titan Bar itself, uh, now supported by Durial. But just for a historical reference, uh, there was a Titan Bar uh, released by Technical 13, uh, and before that by Thorondor, and before that by Habna, and that was the original Titan Bar. And so you can kind of step backwards through time and see this historical record, which just is less useful. And so we, uh, in Literal Plugin Compendium, just that most recent correctest Titan Bar is shown. So let's go ahead and check that. Uh, in uh, the bottom area of this window, you can see uh, a little bit of a description. And if we go ahead and click the Add button in the upper right, then at the bottom we see saw very fast. It said it was downloading, it was extracting, it was installing, uh, and then it's done super fast. And we can see in the plugins directory, we now also have Hobna plugins. And Hobna was the first author of Titan Bar, so all of the um, uh, uh, authors that have come after them have just kept it in that same location. So even though this is currently being supported by Durial, it's still in Have No Plugins. Okay, so that is the installation Titan Bar, but it doesn't just appear in the game. If we come into the Carrot menu, hover over System, and go to Plugin Manager, or we can simply type in slash, uh, it's under my face, but slash Plugins Space Manager, then we get this UI. And so um, in this UI, Lord of the Rings Online still only thinks there's Minstrel Buff installed. And that's because it doesn't pay attention to the plugins folder once the game has opened. Uh, but this little green circle here will force the uh, Lord of the Rings Online to refresh this list. Oh, and we can see Titan Bar is here now, hooray. Now, just like any other plugin, if we wanna uh, have Titan Bar running, we can hit the load button and Titan Bar should load with a default configuration. Titan Bar is highly configurable. Uh, so for instance, I really like having both server time and local time on there. Uh, I really like having uh, currency on there so I can keep an eye on the funds of all my characters. Uh, but the, uh, oh, uh, inventory, yeah, that's a lot of fun. But some of the things like the durability or items on my character, they, that just doesn't do much for me. The durability is especially unuseful because of the VIP subscriber buffs, but I don't pay that much attention to my equipment in general. Uh, whereas I do pay a lot of attention to my inventory, uh, which I like to keep sparse. So um, just as an example of configuration of Titan Bar, if I right click on the, sorry, um, if I left click on this uh, uh, little backpack, it looks like a double left click, it's gonna pull open the backpack and at the bottom are the, con the configuration options. Show used over free slots. I don't, uh, I don't need to know how many free slots I've got. In fact, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't need the total. I just need to know how much do I have left. So my preferred way of seeing my inventory is spaces remaining. Doesn't matter how many spaces I have, just how many I have left. And so I have 121 spaces remaining. Great, thank you Titan Bar. A uh, Titan Bar is about presenting the information you want to see on your screen within the limits of plugins. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and unload Titan Bar. And the other one that i7 mentioned in chat was Deed Tracker. So same process, we are in the add new plugins tab of the plugin compendium. We're gonna go ahead and type in Deed uh, and there are two that comes up, Warbands and Deed Slayer. That one looks interesting. I want, keep meaning to take a look at it. I believe it's by a French plugin developer, uh, but it does have English support, I believe. But we'll go ahead and come down to the Deed Tracker by B4, that's me, and click the Add button. We can see again, downloading, extracting, downloading, extracting, all done. Awesome. Um, takes care of any prerequisites for you. Okay. And it looks like i7 is having success with Titan Bar. Awesome. So same thing. I just added the Deed Tracker plugin. I need to hit the green circle to refresh the list. And then Deed Tracker pops up. Now, as it happens, there's a slight glitch where um, we uh, Deed Tracker 
relies on the turbine files, but it also goes ahead and accidentally installs the turbine plugins. So if you don't like that, that's safe to delete and we can refresh and all those example plugins go away. And we have the D-Tracker. Now D-Tracker has a lot of information in there, so it takes a second or two to load up. And by default, two things show up. The D-Tracker window here in the center of the screen and the D-Tracker little icon uh, that you can use to minimize and, max, uh, and show that screen. By default, you can just click and drag that little button wherever you wanna go. I like to bring down here below the chat window. Uh, and this is the D-Tracker. As Little Red had pointed out, its uh, primary purpose is to do two things. We'll call it th two and a half or three. Uh, in game, the deed log doesn't show you any deeds you haven't started or that are hidden, even if you have started them. And I wanted to see them all. And so uh, the other thing the deed log does is sorts them first by type and then alphabetically, which I find personally a little frustrating. So instead, I uh, order them hierarchically. So all of the things that you have to do to finish Explorer of Breland are presented underneath Explorer of Breland, for instance. And then after that, in the order of uh, how they show up in the uh, deed itself, I think. Let's see. Let's come back in, Explorer of Deedland. We can see Barrow Downs, Barrow Downs, Old Forest, Old Forest, Ruins of Breland, Lower of the Cardinal French, History of the Dunedin, Flowers of the Old Forest. So as a, a reasonable default instead of alphabetically. So that's the idea of the deed tracker. Show you the deeds that are available, whether you've started them or not, whether they're hidden or not, and show you what you can get from them as far as Lotro points go and as far as virtue experience goes. So we can see in Breland, if I hadn't done any of them, there's 300 Lotro points and 90,000 virtue experience available. And in the Shire, especially now with Yonder Shire, 155 Lotro points and 50,000 virtue experience. So if you are first starting the game and you see something in the Lotro store for 100 Lotro points, that can feel expensive. But remember that you can clear 100 Lotro points just doing everything in the Shire, uh, which is, I don't know about easy, but straightforward. Uh, some of those postal runs can be challenging. Uh, so that's what's up with D Tracker, and that's uh, what, what I do, now you can definitely manually download each of these things from the Lotra interface website. You do not need to use the plugin compendium. This is an optional, extra nice to have. If you do want to download things manually, for instance, if I want to search for D Tracker, and I was, had another question, so I'll open up a tab. Uh, if I want to install this, most plugins will include an installation and startup section. So to install, first, make sure you have the turbine classes and examples installed from this link. Okay, go and install that, come back. <laughs> and it'll tell you uh, where to go. Next, download and unzip this thing. You'll get a folder. Here's how, how to do it. Or if you prefer, use the plugin compendium. So all of these can be done manually if you feel at all uncertain about a third party program or uncomfortable, just wanna see how it works yourself Totally fine. But uh, Plugin Compendium is lovely. I can't recommend it enough. The one thing it currently doesn't support very well are patches. So if you're looking to have a patch for a plugin, then that still is a bit of a manual process where you download the patch and copy it over into the right place. And it probably overwrites some files because that, that's what patches do. Uh, but I think Lunar Water has thoughts about making that process better. Uh, or if not, uh, one of us in the community might jump in there and help. Uh, summer vacation is coming up for me, so you'll never know. Okay, so that's Lotro interface, and that's the Lotro plugin compendium that you can use to download and install plugins uh, quite seamlessly. Sounds like it was very effective for i7 with Titan Bar. Hopefully it works uh, well with DTracker and any other plugins you happen to like. I'll go ahead and toss a plugins command into chat here. Uh, where uh, mentioned some of the more popular ones that the streamers here on Lotro Stream like. Uh, so we've got Buff Bars, D-Tracker, Kiki Inventory, Minstrel Buff, Opaque Quest Tracker, Titan Bar, Travel Window 2, and Sequence Bars, Combat Analysis, Daily Task, and more map are great as well. Yes, <laughs> I agree with that. Hmm. I7 has, says, once D-Tracker is installed and working, how do we open it up each time we use it? Well, the little button that appears in the center of the screen to start 
goes a little opaque if your mouse cursor isn't over it. And that can make it hard to see, especially if it happens to show up um, with a brown background. But that little button, put it somewhere safe, and then whenever you click it, it will either make the window show up or hide. But the deed tracker is designed to uh, automatically track when you complete a deed. So you do not have to check off uh, deeds. Now, if you, like me, already have a character and would like to catch deed tracker up, you can also make a use of a different third party program called the, oh, and I'll get these two confused, the Lotro Companion, as opposed to the plugin Compendium. And uh, <laughs> those two. So this is the Lotro Companion, and it is designed to kind of peek into the insides of what Lord of the Rings Online is doing and grab information about your character. So for instance, I'm gonna go ahead and pre-open my vault and my wardrobe and my shared storage because if, uh, the first time you do that, after you've logged in, you, uh, your client grabs all that information from the server. Otherwise, the client doesn't know what's in your vault when you first log in, which is good. It uh, speeds up your login process. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit that start button on the import from local client. Now we can see it has seen that the server is Treebeard, language is English, client type is 64-bit, and we can see it's starting to uh, make progress in uh, loading all that information. Squirrel says, that's some weird money. Well, I'm not sure which money you're referring to. Uh, oh, yes. I have, yes, so I ran out of tabs and I needed a place to store the in-league and ale reputation items that only pop up during festivals. And uh, yeah, so I have a bucket for reputation items where hobnatigans kind of counts and maybe the, the, the drinks for in-league and ale association would, would best be in reputation, except they, they intermix with the other reputation items, whereas in the money bucket, they just all, all the, the drinks are together. Uh, and then I've got a, a bucket for task items and a bucket for medals and crit items and uh, buckets for each of my four characters that I play or at least craft with. And then a, a bucket for any of the other characters on my account where I want to pass things around. And a bucket for Little Redhead's character. Uh, and just, you know, auction stuff or housing stuff. Or, you know, I get, kind of ran out of buckets. I, I could, you know, if I could buy more buckets in my shared storage for like 50 Lotro a, a pop, or Lotro Friends a pop, I would have more. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. Uh, but good catch. Uh, that was a side effect. I, I mean, if I, I guess I could say money slash in league ill association or something. In the, there we go. There's a more correct label. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, we, we can see the import process is done. So there is a uh, file that is distributed with the deed tracker plugin, and it's called import deed completion from Lotro Companion. It does what it says on the tin. Uh, now, you do have to be able to launch hypertext applications on your computer. Uh, that is available generally, but sometimes uh, a file association a file association go, goes wonky and you get a, would you like to go to the Microsoft store to find something for this? That's not right. Uh, but it's only happened to a couple people so far that I know of. So it's one of those, eh, this is out, outside the, the plugin environment. So I don't know. So we can see the following companions can be imported. Uh, Affidale, Minstro, great, we'll just do that. Awesome. So we can see a little success message. It just got imported. And if we come back into the game, the next time the deed tracker is loaded, it's gonna go ahead and see that there's an import available. So unload here, lo uh, click and load. There we go. And we can see Lotro Companion import window pops up. And it says, hey, by the way, there's 908 deeds that Lotro Companion thinks you've completed. Do you wanna just go ahead and mark those? And we say yes. Awesome. So, uh, excellent question. I failed to mention how to get this. And the link often causes me a little bit of problems. So let me pull up instead. 
Oops. So D tracker dot uh, life beyond the shire dot com. And this is also, I believe, called out in the description here. Yeah, dtracker.lifebeyondtheshire.com. Excellent. Uh, and there is a import deed completion uh, page. And here is the link. <laughs> OK, so Lotro, Lotro companion link. And I've just gone ahead and thrown that into chat there. Now, that one is a little bit of uh, a um, longer installation process. Uh, it comes as a zip file, and there's a bazillion files in there. Oh, sure. I guess it just happened. Um, so there's a lot of files in here. Uh, and so there's a lot of tiny files. So it takes a while to extract that. But once you do, you uh, it just sits in place wherever you want to put it. I put it in my documents folder. Uh, personally, but it goes wherever you want it to. Uh, and once it's downloaded, let me uh, come back out into Documents. Uh, and we can see Lotro Companion 19.2.33.0.5. Uh, and then in there is the app and uh, Lotro uh, Java. Where are you? Oh, sorry, here it is. Uh, in Lotro Companion, there's a Lotro Companion.exe. Uh, I have pinned that to my start menu to make this easier. So you don't have to use the Lotro Companion, but I think it's a really interesting uh, tool. So for instance, if I want to see, hey, what, what uh, deeds have I completed, um, then this is a way to browse that without having to launch the game. Uh, so if you're just planning with uh, plotting with someone, you haven't launched the game, you can be like, well, uh, we could go off to Eastern Gondor, where I haven't done any of these deeds, uh, or that kind of thing. There's also a really neat feature that's not going to show up well on this character because I've done all my quests, uh, all my deeds that I can. Let's go over to Arda. And if we go to the deeds on Arda and click on maps, we're going to see a map that shows every uh, location-based deed objective. For, so for instance, uh, here is a um, uh, probably the... Um, Ah, find Gathforth near objective. Uh, and so you can just see a bunch of uh, location objectives for Angmar in Breland. Oh, cool. Some Barrow Down stuff. In Durin's Way. Oh, I haven't discovered the Chamber of the Crosshairs. In Aragion. All of these things. So for any deed you've started, that's a great way to kind of be like, oh, I've got five minutes. Oh, I could pop into Aragion and, and discover the Redhorn Pass. Cool. If you happen to have a character that's not doing a completionist run, where you're going to hit these things eventually, almost certainly, when you're doing quests, then this can be a quick way to get those exploration deeds out of the way, uh, or, or kind of hone in on what's still left. Cool. So that's the uh, the import process of uh, the Lotro Companion and how to make that work with Deed Tracker, because that's kind of a, a bummer if you open up Deed Tracker and you've completed a thousand deeds and you're just looking at a blank slate, and that's a way to bypass that. Unfortunately, there's no deed. Sorry, there's no Lua interface for a plugin to interrogate that information from Lutra directory directly. Hey, what deeds are completed? What ones aren't? Uh, that that feature is not currently in the Lua API. But by using this third-party program that can kind of peek in there and see, uh, we can take advantage of that. Import 900 completed deeds. Now, when I open up my deed tracker, we can see. Oh yes, I have completed. All but one deed in Breland. I'm going to guess that's one thing drives out another. Yes. That's a legendary server deed, I believe. Cool. Don't forget that Deed Tracker also has a bunch of different options to configure how it works for you. Things like, do you want to hide those completed deeds or not? I'm going to say yes. Cool. Uh, make it a little bit more obvious which ones I don't have. You can hide. They do all sorts of things. Don't include those deeds that are above my level, that kind of thing. Uh, so we can see uh, that right now, Plugin Compendium thinks there's 2,800 Lotra points available to me within my level range. Cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the featured topic of tonight's stream. But if you have any more questions about the installation or use of plugins, don't 
uh, hesitate to toss them in there. I'm fine with getting distracted. Oh, but a note about plugins. Uh, plugins are stored in a different place than their save files. If you look at your Lord of the Rings online folder in your documents, you're gonna see plugins, but you'll also see plugin data. Everything a plugin saves goes into the plugin data folder. So you can delete a plugin and install it later, and you have not deleted any of the data. Conversely, if you accidentally delete your plugin data directory, all of your plugins will act as if you just installed them. It is possible, though I don't see it very often because, you know, uh, why would I? <laughs> no. Um, it is possible occasionally for a plugin to fail at saving its file. And so you don't have to do this, but if you have the bandwidth, I'd recommend just backing up what's in your plugin data directory, I don't know, once a month, maybe less often, depending on how many plugins you use. Just, you know, if you have a bunch of configuration if, uh, information, just copy that somewhere else once a month. Uh, and that way, if anything goes wonky, uh, you have a backup. Now you might just back up your entire documents to the Lord of the Rings online folder to another location once in a while because your Lord of the Rings online will behave differently if this goes away. Uh, it's where your key map is stored. It's where your user preferences are stored. Uh, if, if that directory goes away, that makes me sad. So uh, just a thought. Uh, the more common thing that people will see, and I see this once in a while, is that you will log in and none of your plugins will have loaded. Lotro will have somehow forgotten which plugins, which of your characters would like to automatically load. And that is information that is stored in the plugin data directory. So if you do have a backup of that, it's super easy to uh, get that information back. In this case, if you come into your server, it's the pluginoptions.xml file. In fact, we can go ahead and take a look at that. It's pretty empty at this point. Uh, so let's uh, let's make that a little bit more interesting. Uh, we'll come back in and plugin managers and we'll say deed tracker is automatically be go going to be loaded for Affidil and Barimer. And minstrel buff will automatically be uh, loaded for Affidil. Awesome. Now, unfortunately, I think this file, no, this file does not get written out until you log off, which I'm disinclined to do right now. Um, but then the contents will come back in. Now, actually be a little bit easier if I come back in, because uh, I have a different, I do have a backup of that file. Uh, so plug it along, plug in data, awesome. And let's come on into Treebeard and open up that plugin options.xml file. And it looks more like this. And it, as you can see, it's very human readable. It's a little hard to be human writable, but you can tweak this file manually if, if you want to, as long as Lord of the Rings Online is not currently running, because uh, it will overwrite this file when it exits. But we can see um, auto load options uh, for each plugin, it's going to list which characters are going to load, or if it is for all of them, it'll just shortcut that and say all characters equals true. And that's for each plugin that has a configuration, it'll show up in here in this list. Uh, so, if you log in and none of your plugins are loading, it's probably because your plugin options.xml file got somehow uh, messed up. And that's about it. Cool. Rock on with your plugin self. Oh, thanks, little redhead. So, yeah, celebration of one year of streaming on the Lotro Stream channel. We're doing a giveaway for 100 Lotro points. I would say let's go ahead and call that in a minute or two. Uh, so, this is, a, let's go ahead and call that a last call. Get your exclamation point giveaways in there. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and draw that soon. And that is for 100 Lotro points. Yeah, that was great. Our, um, Let's see. Cool. Um, so, when we're working on plugins, these plugins are Lua 
text uh, text files uh, with Lua, Lua um, language, and you can use an ordinary text file editor to edit them. You can also step it up a little bit. Recently, we've been using Visual Studio Code to do our editing. And Visual Studio Code can do syntax highlighting uh, and other similar cool things uh, if you add in the Lua extension. Now, if you're doing Lotro specific development, you should also think about uh, throwing in the Lotro API extension, which uh, has information about the turbine specific stuff. So that's the setup we've got today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and collapse this back down to a single t uh, text file. Cool. All right, so I recommend keeping a little to-do file where you can remember what was I doing last time I was developing. Uh, this is a passion project. Uh, I don't uh, get to do plugin development every day. Sometimes I get to do it once a week. So having a file to remind me where was I is very helpful. And we can see on Melodic Interlude, we had a couple of things left to do. Now, one of them is really easy and it's gonna help get my brain going. And that's having an option to control whether or not this window happens. Just like with the war speech uh, option that we did last time, we're gonna go ahead and add a checkbox to the options window to allow a user to say yes or no. Cool. After that, we're gonna go ahead and try to add some skills to the window. And then finally, once we have a window size that seems to be the right size, we'll make sure that the title is uh, hasn't gone wonky uh, if the window is uh, not wide enough. And that is good. Let's go ahead and add some white space so I don't get distracted by all the other stuff I wanna do. It's not there, it is. Okay, so um, in the Minstrel Buff plugin, when it is loaded, and plugins need to be loaded for you to see their options window, uh, in the plugin manager, you can click on options. And this is an optional thing. Some uh, plugins will have their own window. Some plugins won't have any options whatsoever, uh, but a lot of plugins will have some sort of configurability. And this is a common place to put it. Um, if there's a small enough amount of options where it can fit in this uh, rather small by default screen. Uh, and when you first load Minstrel Buffs, uh, the windows that uh, comes with it will kind of default to this upper left position. I'm gonna go ahead and drag a couple of those around. That's the main Minstrel Buffs window. We have a soliloquy tracker. We'll move that over here. And let's see. Where is the other? Ah, there it is, Melodic Interlude. We'll go ahead and put that there. All right, well, I'm seeing something wrong right away. Melodic interlude is visible. Let's see, if I load it again. Okay, so melodic interlude becomes visible, and th this is a bug, it becomes visible when we try to move it, but doesn't stop being visible when we stop moving it. Great, we found a bug. Let's go ahead and log that. So, melodic interlude becomes visible during drag. Uh, well, during uh, uh, when unlocked, we'll say. But does not hide when locked. Excellent. And that's just a case of us not tracking our, our states correctly. Uh, somehow that I should be visible because of the unlock has just become I should be visible. Cool. Uh, I love finding bugs now rather than later. So let's come on in to the Melodic Interlude window and take a look at how it deals with the unlock notification. I know I said we're gonna do options. I'm getting uh, distracted by a bug because the sooner I fix bugs, the better it is for me mentally. Okay, so we can see in the process key down, the window is paying attention to keystrokes. Uh, we're checking if the key uh, equals reposition UI then we're gonna do something. And as a rule of thumb, I highly recommend if you're gonna pay attention to uh, uh, keystrokes, 
then what did I call it? Reposition UI. I highly recommend naming the thing the same as you see in the in the uh, key mapping interface. Reposition UI. Cool. That's the thing where you hit control backslash uh, for me, and you get a drag bar for all, almost all of your windows, and you can move around. It's great. Uh, it's called a reposition UI. So I recommend naming your variables that store that value. In this case, it is uh, the hex, hex value of 100007B. Um, you know, I named it, it's a key action reposition UI, and that way I can find it in this list by just uh, searching for that name. Because a lot, of, a lot of plugins will just call it lock and unlock, that's cool. Uh, if I search for lock and unlock, all I get are lock and unlock quick slots, which is not helpful. So, naming your variables, the same thing as what you would search for to find them in the UI, very helpful, can't recommend it enough. Okay, when that happens, we're going to come on into UI locked. Okay, so I can see what happened. Um, late in last week's uh, development, we added a new set visibility function to track uh, the, the, the states uh, that we wanted to pay attention to. And we did not remember to come back in and make use of it in the UI locked. We're just uh, calling set visibility direct, uh, visible directly. Uh, so we want to go ahead and instead of calling set visible, we want to go ahead and uh, call set visibility. And I'm not a big fan of how similar these names are, but that is the naming convention that Minstrel Buff was using when I got here. So the classic, it was like that when I got here, but to code. And in a way, a, a confusing naming convention that you are at least consistent with is probably a little bit better than half of it being confusing naming and half of it being good naming, but the two don't look at all the same. And then you're just reading basically two different pieces of code uh, in one file, and that's just, that's hard to do. Uh, so being consistent with how it was until you can go and do a change of all of it at once is probably the, the, the nicer way to go for you and anyone else who's looking at the code. Okay, so we can see we're setting uh, the self.locked. So the question is, what does set visibility pay attention to? Currently, set visibility is, is not paying attention to the locked variable. So we have gone ahead and said, use this function to determine visibility. We're gonna unload and reload the plugin to refresh that code. Yeah, um, and we can see now the window doesn't show up at all. Okay, now does it still show up when we use our debug options? It does, awesome. So this is slightly better. All right, so Little Redhead has gone ahead and closed the giveaway. So we're gonna go ahead and do a drawing. One of the four of you who did an entry, it's i7, congratulations. This is, this is what you get for sticking around. So I7, I assume you are still here. Um, say something in chat, and a little redhead will go ahead and message that code to you in uh, Twitch. And thanks for following the stream. I7 is here. Excellent. I'm not a huge stickler of it, but we do want you to be present to win. Otherwise, it causes headache. <laughs> okay. So um, we now have a, a window, which is currently correctly showing when it should, but not during the drag process. And that means we wanna pay attention to this self.locked uh, property that we're keeping track of. Okay, so self.locked is going to be What's going on with that variable name? I don't like that variable name. Is it visible or draggable? No. No, we just want Oh, I guess it's because it's 
being sent to both set bar visible and set draggable. I don't like that. Um, so, oh good, i7 has gotten it around. So, little redhead, let's go ahead and start up a new one. And anyone who is in chat, go ahead, once it's open, and enter the new raffle. I'm sorry, giveaway. We have a random issue with that. And then, I guess, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and do a one win per stream, just to keep it fair. Okay, so I don't like this name. Um, in fact, I don't really like self.lock, but that is consistent with how the plugin was going. So, um, let's go ahead and rename that. Uh, so, I'm, in, in order to rename this, I'm actually just gonna open up a quick little Sublime Text uh, buffer. And in the Sublime Text, it makes it very easy to only change this and not anything else. We're gonna go ahead and say instead, uh, should drag bar be visible? No, nope, I've already changed my mind. Should drag bar be active? There we go. And by rephrasing it in that way, I'm hoping it'll be a little bit more obvious why I have this at all. You know, I say that. What's going on here? I'm just observing that self.locked is not being set until after we save off a copy of the old value. Let's come back in and look in the constructor for that self.locked. So we're gonna go ahead and say UI elements cannot be repositioned. If I were feeling really uh, into uh, making it more obvious, I might even have a local uh, variable to this file with something like, you know, UI elements cannot be repositioned equals uh, true, and then another one for UI elements can be repositioned. And that one is just equals false. And then you could come back in and set your uh, self.locked equals UI elements cannot be repositioned, right? True and false do not feel useful in this context. But uh, that's just me uh, going off on a tangent here. So self.locked is defaulting to true. We're assuming we're not repositioning anything. Awesome. So uh, when we uh, process the key down, we're gonna go ahead and, and pass in not self.locked, okay. And then in the UI, so if it was true, now it's gonna be false. Okay, so I, I want to do this correctly. We're going to go ahead and say self.locked equals that new value and is visible or draggable. Uh, was renamed should drag bars be active. And we're going to go ahead and call that equals not self-locked. Okay, I do not like that. Let's find out. Uh, and then we can go ahead and really ca capture that logic. So we are locked or not locked. The drag bar should be active if we are not locked. And there we go. Let's go ahead and reload, see if I made any errors. Looks like not so far. Okay. Now we just need to pay attention to self.locked. So. If we are in set visibility, um, that variable name just doesn't feel very useful. 
and it's going to get even more complicated. So we're going to rename that variable just to is visible. And we want to be visible if we're shown and not hidden. Cool. Or uh, self dot, uh, or if we're not locked. So either we are not locked, in which case we don't care about anything else. We'll use a short circuiting Boolean uh, evaluation. Uh, so this thing, if that's true, we don't even look at the rest. Or if we're not repositioning, then we can fall back on the old logic of shown but not hidden. Awesome. <laughs> And again, hiding is taking advantage of the F12 button to hide the UI, which makes for some lovely screenshots, especially if you have something scenic in view as we do right now. Uh, so that's what's going on, is you want to respect that F12 button and get your plugin out of the way. Okay, so not lock. Uh, that being said, yeah, if we unlock Windows, uh, some plugins will pay attention to that. Now, it looks like only Minstrel Buffs is going to pay attention to that, but that's the only plugin that's loaded. Uh, so let's satisfy my curiosity. If we carrot window system plugin manager and bring on, say, Titan Bar, oh, it doesn't have much in the way of repositionability, does it? Oh, it hides itself during that. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I like it. Um, Titan Bar is not a good example for that. What is a better example? Well, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, so yes, if you go to reposition stuff, we can see the game thinks that you should not see reposition elements uh, if the HUD is off, even if you've asked for it. Interesting. We can We can follow along with that. What would that look like? Um, we know that self.hidden is all about that. So if it is not locked and uh, not hidden, then drag bars should be active. That's an easy enough fix to do. If we go ahead and unload and reload, we can still see the melodic interlude window. But let's go ahead and turn off our HUD. Oh, that's funny. Drag bars is no longer showing up, but the window itself is. Cool. That's progress. Cool. So let's rework our logic a little bit. We care most about not being hidden. So if is visible equals not self dot hidden, and now these are uh, redundant parentheses, but they, uh, for me they help emphasize the logic. Uh, if it's not hidden and either not self dot locked or self dot shown. I7 says the start button on the import isn't working. Ah, excellent point. So a lot of people, when they run their Lord of the Rings online client, will get a authentication pop-up saying, do you want to allow this program to change your computer? Now you can, you can bypass that with the correct um, command line argument, but for most people, that's kind of a, a beyond their comfort level. So the important thing is if your Lotro said, do you want to allow this to change your computer? And you said yes, it has escalated and you need to do the same with your Lotro Companion. So when you launch your Lotro Companion, and that's just underneath me, um, go ahead and right click and under more, you'll, uh, sorry, in your start menu. Uh, and again, this is assuming on Windows, it'll be a little bit different on other platforms, but you're looking for that run as administrator option. Now, I don't think this will show up on the stream, but it, it pops up an a interface that I can see saying, do you want to allow this app to make changes to your device? And the important thing is, 
you say the same thing to Lotro Companion as you did to Lotro. Uh, if Lotro is escalated, then Lotro Companion must also be escalated so it can uh, kind of peek in there. So give that a try, I7. Go ahead and close down Lotro Companion. Try to relaunch it with this more run as administrator option and see if uh, the import button starts working again. It's sort of a gotcha because uh, for some of us, we don't see that uh, except during patches, uh, but for a lot of uh, for a lot of players, you do see that. Okay. Um, so we updated this logic to say visible means we can't be hidden, and then if we're not hidden, then either um, we're not locked or um, we're we're supposed to be shown. So unload, reload. Let's go take a look. Cool, that green box shows up. If we had the UI, it doesn't show up. Actually, we can see this is where the other two parts of the minstrel uh, buffs uh, are kind of not following the convention of the game. So we could circle back around and fix that up. Hey, Lunar Water, welcome to chat. Hey, Lunar Water, we're currently doing a giveaway for 100 Lotro points. Uh, if you type exclamation point giveaway, you will also be entered. Ah, oh, neat. Thank you uh, for putting that in there, little redhead, little redhead or LRH. Awesome. We got a couple more people in there. We must be in it to win it and all that. Okay. So let's make a to do item. Just as a reminder, that soliloquy of spirit window and main window show during hidden HUD when reposition is enabled. Other game. Uh, Windows do not. Cool. So that's our mo that's what we see, and that's our motivation for why we'd want to change it. Cool. And then we can just kind of put that out of our memory. We can't forget about it now. But in the meantime, we have a set visibility function that's been updated to take into account the locked status, and uh, we have updated the logic to match what's going on in the game, which is that. It shouldn't show up um, when the HUD is hidden, even if you ask it to. Awesome. So, now, I completely forgot about this. It's been a while since I've done any sort of snapshots, commits to source control. Uh, and that's probably not a bad idea to, uh, to maybe go back and uh, take a look at that. So, oh. We got the green box, no green box. Excellent. It can start, it can stop. Okay, so we didn't break anything in the process that we know of. So let's go ahead and pause on the coding and open up our source control. In this case, I'm using the program fork, which is wrapping around a Git repository. This is the minstrel buff repository. And I'm gonna go ahead and see what unsaved changes do I have? Oh my goodness, there's so many. Now, changes to the to-do file, I'm not worried about. We can go ahead and just uh, accept those. But we can see the ripping out of the melodic interlude from the buff window and placing it into its own window has not been committed yet. And that's gonna be an important thing to do. All right. So let's go ahead and say, moved melodic interlude to its own window. So that'll be a fine commit message. And let's go back and find those changes that are specific for this. Uh, moving melodic interlude, awesome. Melodic interlude start, stop, yeah. All of that is good, take it all. In the main, we have a melodic interlude window. Yep, we're gonna need that. Oh, goodness. We still have a, uh, a debug statement writing out. Making the thing, yes, it, it, it's, I've been ignoring it this whole time. Uh, but we can see making the thing. 
So that was when I was trying to figure out why the window wasn't showing up. And it's like, by golly, I'm going to see some side effect from this code that is being written, even if it's not my window. So we're going to go ahead and not take that. So for right now, uh, we'll go ahead and that is in main.lua. We can go ahead and there's a couple of things we can do. We can go into the file itself and edit, or we can take advantage of Fork's ability to discard changes. So we're going to highlight the thing and press the delete key. Do you want to discard all your changes in the selected lines? I do. And it's gone. But in the meantime, the window itself, cool, we want that. And how we go ahead and call start and stop, those are both great. Oh, and a rogue new line came in at the end of the file. How do I feel about that? I don't like it. There was already an, a new line at the end of the file. We're going to get rid of that one. Cool. Melodic interlude window. We're going to want all of that. So we'll take the whole file. Options window. This is where we go ahead and, again, in the debug options, change how we're triggering the window. We want it. Take it. And in our settings, we have a default position that can be uh, updated and saved for melodic interlude position X and Y. We're going to take that. We'll fix up the number. And we some, have some helper functions. Defaults to 200, 200, but you can move it around. Awesome. And finally, a title for the window. We're going to take that. The German and French ones haven't been translated yet. That's OK as long as something is in there. That's the important thing. Cool. Oh, we have um, Jason asking in chat. Hi, sorry for intruding. Recently started listening to MythGuard's Exploring the Lord of the Rings with the Tolkien professor, Dr. Corey Olson. Is that still happening on this channel? Um, uh, Dr. Corey Olson is still streaming on this channel. He streams on Fridays. Um, let's see. Um, so that is the twitch.tv slash signumu entry there. And so on Fridays, you can find uh, Corey Olson here. And on other days, uh, you'll be able to find Corey at twitch.tv slash signumu. And you found the VODs excellent or video on demand. I assume that means for all that I occasionally stream here, I don't know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> That's OK. Uh, so you found them. Awesome. Yeah, one of the side effects of Lord of the Rings Online being a partner channel with Twitch is uh, things don't get deleted, which is very handy if you're looking for that one stream from four years ago. OK, so we've just gathered all of the changes that were a part of separating out Melodic Interlude into its own window. Now, the one thing is to ask, what branch are we on? Excellent. Melodic Interlude? That's great. So we're going to go ahead and take that snapshot or make a commit. We've committed those nine files. Awesome. And that lets us, uh, uh, that bug fix was included. Uh, sometimes I, I like to separate those out, but that's fine. Oh, and Jinjar points out. Uh, that uh, Corey has taken some time off uh, to go to some moots and may not be on this week. Um, if you pop on whenever Corey is supposed to be on and isn't, generally Druid's Fire will go ahead and take their place. Um, so you can just say, hey, is Corey going to be here today? And the fact that Druid's Fire is streaming at that time is probably a no, but Druid's Fire will know for sure. Uh, da, da, da. And Jason says, awesome. Thank you so much. Yep, you're very welcome. You've been listening to the version with the field trips in Lotro. Yeah, I, I've uh, seen or peeked uh, over Little Redhead's shoulder as she's been watching some of those, and it looks like a lot of fun. OK. So we went ahead and ducked back into our source control program to go ahead and take that snapshot uh, that lets us easily revert any changes back to where we are right now. So let's go ahead and duck back into the code side of things. All right, so we had melodic interlude becomes visible when unlocked, but does not hide when locked. Awesome, fixed it and made it slightly better. So let's go ahead and head on back to 
you know, these things were done, we can delete them. Add setting to control if this window pops up. Awesome, let's do it. Oh, thanks, all right ahead. There is a giveaway active. Uh, stick around for a giveaway, it's for 100 Lotro points. Uh, and go ahead and type that exclamation point giveaway to enter. Uh, we'll probably do that um, very soon. Let's uh, let's call it five minutes from now. Uh, so at ten minutes still, we'll go ahead and do that drawing, and maybe start uh, uh, another one after that. Why not? It's been a year. It's celebration. Excellent. <laughs> Message has been updated. Man, I, I get so used to systems like Discord where you can go back and edit a message for like, oops, I mistyped something. Uh, and then I come to systems like Twitch or even just text messaging and it's like, oh, or, or WhatsApp. And it's like, oh, I've sent something and there were obvious mistakes in there. I would like to go fix that. Oh, you can't. It's there forever. Uh, but I don't want it to be there. Okay, so um, we're gonna go ahead and add that setting to control of melodic interlude pops up. This is gonna be in the options window and it's gonna be just like the show war speech timers option. So uh, we can, whenever we're adding an option that's kind of like another option, yeah, just copy as much of that behavior as you can. We're gonna go to the options window to start. Okay. So we're currently in the show debug options. We're gonna collapse that down because we're looking at non uh, uh, options. And we can see, oh, there was a comment that got um, misplaced. Let's go ahead and move that back. All right, so we see an options show war speech timers. Awesome. And how is this going to be saved? We're gonna um, call set war speech timers changed. Okay, um, let's go ahead and make a new function. Instead of uh, set, sh uh, set show war speech change, it'll be set show melodic interlude changed. And that's going to go ahead and dispatch that to the settings. So let's go ahead and put a pin in on it. Uh, and uh, a way to put a pin in it is go ahead and type something illegal and the L Lotro parser will die when it, when it hits that line. So we can see, oops, unexpected symbol near tilde. Great, that's uh, that's my pin. I'm not gonna forget to come back to that. But in the meantime, we're gonna need a function in settings to deal with this. So let's go ahead and come on into the settings file. And we know it was set show war speech timers. So we're gonna do something very similar. Now there was also a corresponding git, so we know oops, that we want a git and a set function. Okay, let's do it. Oh, there's a very unhappy child next door. Well, they're vocalizing that they're unhappy. Although I don't speak Dutch, maybe it's a very happy child. No, I don't speak Dutch very well, but I'm pretty sure it's an unhappy child. All right, so uh, again, we have the uh, war speech showing up. Uh, we're gonna let's go ahead and yank that out into a separate little uh, uh, text area here. And here, anywhere where we see uh, war speech timers, let's go ahead and just replace that with melodic interlude. Cool. Whoops, don't want to save that. So now we have a git show melodic interlude. Uh, and in the settings table, that's going to be show melodic interlude. Uh, and then the set, show melodic interlude. We're going to save it into show melodic interlude. Awesome. And then if type self dot show melodic interlude change equals function, then go ahead and call that function. All that looks great. So we can go ahead and paste that in. And again, as I mentioned last time, if you get to the point where you're doing a lot of copy pasting to do something, like every time you add an option, you've got to do this exact same copy pasting, something is probably not quite right with your process. I think this could be streamlined. Maybe there could just be a generic git setting and you pass in the name of the setting, this thing. 
uh, save setting, you pass in the value and the name of the setting, and it goes ahead and does the thing. And then there's a lookup table with that name for a callback function. So I think that is a thing that I would like to do. Simplify the settings system so that you don't have to add two new functions for every setting. Let's, let's uh, keep that in the back of our head. Now, of course, some of these are, are a little bit harder, maybe, but they, they all look so similar to each other. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with that as a maybe idea. In the meantime, we can see that the show melodic interlude changed. There is no entry for that that the Lua extension can find. So this is a benefit of doing this in Visual Studio Code instead of, say, a notepad variant, is it can say, hey, you set a thing, but that thing doesn't exist. Cool. Well, where does the worst speech ones come in? Awesome. We can go ahead and show melodic interlude change equals nil here, and then at least it has been defined. OK. So um, no more issues here. Awesome. Let's go ahead and unpin what we were previously working on. And that was the set show melodic interlude. Awesome. We're going to come on in here. And now we're calling um, set melodic uh, show melodic interlude. Well, that's not right. Oh, yeah, the settings, settings is done a little bit weirdly. We're going to go ahead and just copy the name of it. So that was set show melodic interlude. And we're going to go ahead and pass the self dot show melodic interlude. Oh, that's not there yet. Um, but it needs to be. So we're not quite there. Repin it. In fact, it can just be a single uh, tilde. It'll still uh, break the parser. OK, so let's come back up. And we want to, again, um, this is going to be a case of a lot of copy pasting because we're just making another checkbox. And again, if we're just making a row of checkboxes, then it would make sense, one checkbox box after another, and the only thing is different is the name of it and what you do when it's clicked. Uh, this should be streamlined into a factory function that just creates the checkbox. Maybe after this. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, show war speech timers. We're going to go ahead and change any instance of that to show melodic interlude. Excellent. And we can pull that back in. Well, I guess I don't need two of those open. To our UI creation. And now we have show melodic interlude checkbox. Awesome. We remembered to parent it. Oh, we do need to change that um, set text. So we're going to go ahead and come on into the English file. And options, we're going to say show melodic interlude equals. And in the English, it's just going to be what it says on the tin, show melodic interlude uh, window. Well, it's so rare for it to happen. Show window. Uh, when triggered. I don't know. I did, eventually, this, this title is going to get so long as to be unmanageable. All right, we'll just start with show melodic interlude window. Maybe we can include something in the help text on the trend interface or something. Ah. Hmm. All right, yes, uh, it's been more than five minutes. Let's go ahead and draw those points. So last minute chance to exclamation point giveaway and Little Redhead's going to close it up. So it's a race. In the meantime, I'm getting more water. Okay, little water, hooray. Um, 
Little Water, if you're present, go ahead and say something in chat, and Little Redhead will message you the code. For anyone who hasn't done this before, when you get a code that you can redeem in the Lotro store, you just click that Lotro store button. Uh, that window will load in the middle of the screen, and then there is a redeem code but, uh, link along the top here. Click that redeem code and paste in whatever it is. Uh, for instance, there is a giveaway right now for universal ingredient packs. So I could type in pack of uni. Uh, I've already actually um, retrieved those, but oh, the code you entered has already been activated. Otherwise, I would have gotten the thing. Cool. Okay. So let's come on back to here. We've got that show melodic interludes and show melodic interlude window. Great. We're just going to copy that into the other language files. So there's our German and there's our French. And maybe if we're lucky, we'll get those localized someday. Okay. UNT says, what are you doing? Excellent question. So we have Lord of the Rings Online, an excellent game, which involves having a staring contest with a goose, if you so desire. Uh, right now we're hanging out here in the 21st hall, and this is a stream all about the plugins within Lord of the Rings Online, both how to install them, how to use them, but mostly how to write them. And so we're using Visual Studio Code to modify the Lua script behind the Minster Buff plugin. I find this a very handy plugin because I play minstrels all the time, so I keep wanting to make it a little bit better, a little bit better. So, right now, we were just going to add an option, so we're going to go ahead and say that is show melodic interlude, and we have get show melodic interlude, set show melodic interlude, awesome, let's give it a try, except we still have this pin that we need to come back and fix. So that was show melodic interlude checkbox instead of the war speech. Let's give that a try. We're going to go ahead and load the plugin. Everything loaded. Great. And now we're going to come into the options and we're going to see show melodic interlude window. Awesome. Here's where I was talking about. Each one of these checkboxes feels like it's doing basically the same thing. Put a checkbox on the screen. Um, it's just changing the text and what happens when you click the box. And so I'm going to put a pin in that. Also, fix, uh, no, um, extract checkbox creation to helper function in options window. Cool. Maybe even spell options correctly. Uh, so that'll be the next thing after I get this thing working. <laughs> so uh, we have the options window where we went ahead and added this checkbox. Oh, we didn't fix the comment. Show melodic interlude window. Awesome. So it is a checkbox. It's parented. It has the right text. It's got a position size. Um, we will remember if it's checked or not from the settings, uh, the save file. And when that checkbox is changed, we're going to go ahead and uh, call this function here. Cool, awesome, let's give it a try. Unload, load, just to clear it out. All right, so we have show melodic interlude and it can be off, in which case we should start paying attention to it or not yet. Uh, and if it's checked, then we should see the window. We can also see that this area is not tall enough to show everything that we went ahead and added another checkbox, but we didn't make the space bigger. And that's a manual process that we're in charge of. So we added another 40 to the height of this window. Let's go ahead and fix that. So we want that height. Let's see. Get option control, control equals that. What on earth is going on here? Oh, I see. You could have a separate window for that. I wonder if it does. Probably not. Okay, so we have a height of 450. Let's go ahead and bump that up to 490. We'll read the plugin. And when we come into the options, we can see, yes, we've got all of this. So we have the setting, but we're not paying attention to that setting yet. So let's go ahead and do that next. 
in the options window, the final piece of the puzzle we need mm -hmm. is that settings get show melodic interlude. Let's see. Oh, we could make use of it in two ways. Yes. Um, so you can register to know if that checkbox has changed. We'll probably take advantage of that. So in main, if we come into war speech, let's see. We want to know about that war speech changed. So, um, show war speech timers. Where does that get? Excellent. We have settings, show war speech timers changed. So we need the initial value for our self.show melodic interlude. And we're just going to go ahead and call self settings, get melodic interlude, get show melodic interlude. And we'll do the same thing. We'll go ahead and request to be notified anytime that checkbox is toggled. And that'll be settings show. We can do the same thing. Pop this on out. Find every war speech timers. And that is now melodic interlude. Great. So show melodic interlude changed equals function. And so, so blah, 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 equals this. Great. So anytime we were going to use that show war speech timers, we can do the same thing. Uh, we were going to say is valid melodic interlude effect. Well, let's check that we actually want to check. <laughs> so self show melodic interlude and is it a valid melodic interlude? Because if it's if we're not checking for melodic interlude, we do not need to check any more than that. So let's give that a try. Now that we're paying attention to this value, we're going to go ahead and come back in. Start works. We pop up that window. Stop works. It goes away. But if we stop paying attention, it was going to work, except I didn't do it right. So in the options window, the way we're faking this out is incomplete. Let's come back into this collapsed debug options section. And let's come on into melodic interlude start and stop. We're going straight to that window to say start and stop. Better would be to go to the main and call effect added with something that looks just enough like this, that it triggers this code. And so what we want to do is instead, no, nope, we're not on that one. So in the options window, instead of calling melodic interpret start, let's instead do MB main and call effect added. Well, is MB main a minstrel buff main? Sure should be. Yes, there we go. So we want to call that effect added. Why don't you know what that is? Undefined field. We'll come back to that. All right, we have an effect added and we just need something where get effect from effect callback is going to succeed. And then we have a get name attached to that thing. So let's take a look at that get effect from effect callback. It has an args. So we're looking for an args dot effect. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, let's call it a local spoof equals a table. Now we know that table, we want it to have an uh, args dot effect. So spoof dot effect equals a table. Uh, and we know we want that to have a get name. So spoof dot get name equals a function that returns a thing. Hello. 
end. And then we can say effect added um, and we need a sender. That's totally fine. Uh, we can go ahead and pass it a sender, or we, it can just be nil since we know it's not used. And then we go ahead and pass in the spoof object. You know, I'm calling it spoof uh, to be consistent with other testing systems. We'll go ahead and call that a mock object. And we'll pass that in here. Okay, so uh, we are passing in a thing that has what we're looking for, probably. But what we need is it for it to be an is valid melodic interlude effect. And for that, we need to come on in to where this is defined. Okay, it should look like melodic interlude. Awesome, that'll be pretty easy. So we're actually gonna return melodic interlude instead. Now, if that's the case, we don't need this uh, manual start anymore, we should actually be making use of the functionality. Let's give that a try. Let's load this back up. <laughs> Little Water, your chat has arrived just after. <laughs> Excellent. But as Little Water pointed out, all of this is duplicating the call to melodic interlude start. Uh, so we'd be very confused if we hadn't uh, caught that right there. So let's go ahead and we've unloaded and we've reloaded. Awesome, let's go into the options and call start. And there's where we get our problem. I can attempt to call method get name a nil value. Interesting. That was a main.lua to 14. Let's come on over there and see what we did wrong. Okay, so we're looking for effect colon get name. Um, interesting. Now I'm wondering if it's that lack of a sender because of that colon uh, syntax. So I'm gonna try it again. Okay, it was not that problem. So I tried to spoof a mock object that had an effect. Oh, of course, uh, that needed to be mock.effect.getName. That'll definitely help. Take out that sender there, that's just silly. And come back in, unload, reload. And let's come back in and try and give it a start. Awesome, we see the window. And the important thing is, if I say don't show, then we don't get that trigger. We've managed to hook back into an earlier part of the system for a more authentic simulation. That's really great. That suggests we can go ahead and do the same thing in other ways. Uh, so let's add a helper function to do this for us. Function um, option window get debug effect. And we'll just call that an effect name. And what are we gonna do? We're gonna do the exact same thing. Uh, in fact, why am I typing it? I should copy that. So we're going to make a table. Uh, we're gonna assign a, a subtable, and in that table is going to be a function. Now I have a feeling this could be done more efficiently. For instance, we can go ahead and declare that effect is already in that mock object. We don't need to add it in another line. And we could probably declare that get name is already in line there. So we could probably do this in a single line and return that mock object. The only change being, of course, a variable effect name. Now this won't work if the plugin needs to use an actual Lotro effect to do something like it does for anthems and ballads. But if this is just triggering, like it does for Soliloquy of Spirit or War Speech or Melodic Interlude, it'll be great. So let's see if this ability to do sort of an inline definition of the mock.effect got dot get name is going to work. So we're gonna go ahead and say local effect equals get debug itself get debug effect name, and we're gonna go pass in uh, melodic interlude, excellent. And once we've got that, you know, I'll still call it mock, because mock objects are a classic part of test-driven de development. Okay, 
Uh, and in that case, we don't need to call melodic interlude stop on the window itself. We can do the same thing. MV main uh, effect removed. And we can see um, if it's an, a valid melodic interlude effect, then we just call that stop. Well, same thing. Let's go ahead and local mock equals self get debug effect. And that's going to be melodic interlude. Now, do we need to assign that uh, effect to a local variable? No, no. We could just pass the result of self get debug effect straight into the function call. I find it useful to decompose those a little bit. For one thing, if I wanted to inspect this with a with a with just a simple right line, uh, it's easier to do that if I've already captured it in a variable. Uh, but for me, this is a little bit easier to say, we're getting, getting a thing and passing it to a function. I can read that personally a little bit easier than if it was all one line. And then I had to sort of read the whole line and say, OK, we're calling a function. Oh, we're passing it the result of another function. And it just, for me, makes it a little bit more effortful to read and interpret what's going on. Uh, so while you can do many things on a single line of code, I kind of like to do a single thing on a line of code. Uh, and it makes it a little bit easier for me to tell, did I do all the things I wanted to do? <laughs> did I do them in the right order? OK, so let's go ahead and give that a try. Can we unload? So we have this, I'm oh, sorry, can we stop? We have the start, we have the stop. Awesome. Now, the stop will still work even if we have turned off the show melodic interlude window. And I feel like this is a, a good thing. Uh, you don't want to have the feature on in order to be able to hide the window. And so this would time out naturally, even if you had turned off the, uh, the show melodic interlude window option. Uh, after that 10 seconds, uh, the game will fire off that melodic interlude, effect removed, the window would disappear. So we only need to stop adding a window. Someone in chat says, hello, hello. Welcome to a stream about Lotro plugins. So we went ahead and, and created a mock effect so that we could simulate that call to effect removed or effect added instead of just going straight to the melodic interlude start on the melodic interlude window. And that uh, gives us a better uh, testing of the entire code flow. Now, if we were feeling really ambitious, we could do the same thing on some of these other debug abilities. The, uh, maybe? Maybe not. Um, But for right now, this is great. So what do we have? All right, so the next thing I wanted to do, let's go ahead and do a, uh, a snapshot, a commit of these changes. So just some little to-do file changes. Uh, what do we have here? We have um, added option to show slash hide the melodic interlude window. OK, so that is our commit message. And here's where we got the initial value. Here's where we requested um, to be notified if that value changes. And here's where we use that value. Awesome. In the options window itself, here's where we made the window bigger. <laughs> here's where we fixed a comment. Uh, here's where we added that melodic interlude window checkbox. And here's where we uh, fixed those debug changes. Now, I'm actually going to hold off on committing those, but we do need that final helper function. Then in our settings, we need those getters and setters. In the strings, we need the show melodic interlude window. There's our German, English, and French. And that's everything. Awesome. Let's go ahead and come back to that option window, though, because fixed how melodic Inter, oops, interlude is um, triggered. There we go. Uh, and here's where we're going to go ahead and use the um, that updated 
mock object. Okay, um, we've got this one and get debug effect. Great. Oh, missed a settings change. Uh, we're gonna need that. Um, initialized callback to nil. No. Okay. Sometimes you just miss a commit. It happens. <laughs> Ario in chat asks a question. Let me go ahead and finish minimizing that window. So yes, this is a stream about plugins in Lord of the Rings Online. Sadly, I am not an employee of SSG, but um, when you say disconnect issues, do you uh, have a specific experience? For instance, some people have a, um, an issue crop up when they do a trade and when the trade completes, their client exits. And when they come back in, everything got traded. Uh, and that is a thing that can happen to some people. Hmm. You received a message saying lost connection to server. Okay. Um, as someone who plays Lord of the Rings online, sometimes more, sometimes less, I don't usually see that unless the server itself is going down for maintenance. The lost connection to server um, I'm more likely to see if um, I personally have a, um, a connection issue somehow. If my internet connection is a bit spotty, then the connection from my client to the server could drop. So I guess my first question would be is how solid do you feel like your internet is? Can you watch videos without them buffering? Uh, do your web, do other web pages be, behave badly? Is it just Lord of the Rings online? It could be. Um, that's the... That's the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe the only thing that comes to mind. Unfortunately, because I haven't seen that particular issue, I don't have um, anything else popping into mind about how to fix it, because I haven't had to fix it for myself. But uh, let me know uh, where we are on that. Uh, in the meantime, let's go ahead and do one last uh, uh, Lotro Point giveaway for the evening. Hopefully, Little Redhead can go ahead and start up that will be for 100 Lotro points. And you can, uh, once it's started, you can do exclamation point giveaway to enter. And this is in celebration of, I've been streaming for a year here on the Lotro stream channel, and that seems pretty cool. Okay, so let's come back in to our to-do file and see what we're gonna do. Ah. I got distracted. This is just gonna be a present to future me. We're gonna go back into this options window and make a helper function for all of these checkboxes that keep happening. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so instead of calling turbine.ui.lotro.button, I wanna call make uh, check, uh, make, oh, I'm sorry, those are the debug buttons. Let's collapse that back down. I wanna call just uh, make checkbox. So function, uh, we're gonna call it option window, uh, make checkbox. And we're gonna start with no parameters, but we are going to need to put parameters in here because uh, not every checkbox is gonna be the same. Cool, Ginger has jumped into the giveaway. Yep, we're gonna leave that running uh, for a little while here. So no rush, but do enter if you would like loader points. Okay, so make checkbox is going to look very similar to how we've been making checkboxes. Um, but we're gonna name that in the function generically. So it's not gonna be self dot, it's just going to be a uh, checkbox. And this is going to be local to the function. I don't need that to be a global variable. So let's drop off that code and we can see local checkbox Okay, first thing, we need something to parent this. So we're gonna pass in the parent as the first parameter of this function. Oh, second of all, we're gonna need the text. Text, 
is a parameter that we can go ahead and pass in. Thirdly, we need the current y, because these are all just being a certain amount down. Set size, I think we can go ahead and uh, do a consistent size here. They can all be the same width. And then we need a, a callback, a callback for what happens when, oh, sorry, initial value. Um, initial value, uh, and then the callback for what to do when it changes. So, callback. Cool. Now, my hope is this will at least um, streamline the creation of these things a little bit. Now, it's going to turn seven lines into maybe five lines, but it'll be a single function call. So let's go ahead and see what that would look like if we do that. Let's see how much we've uh, saved here. So self.show melodic into the checkbox will instead be um, self make checkbox. All right, so we know it's going to be parent. We know it's going to be lang options show melodic interlude. We know it's going to be at the current y. Uh, we know it's going to be self settings dot uh, get show melodic interlude. And we're just going to retrieve that value. And finally, we know it's going to be a function that looks just like what we already did. So an anonymous function declared here. And there we go. Now, of course, we're not doing anything with sender and args. There would be passed and we would accept them, uh, but we're not actually doing anything with them. So it might be arguably better to write this as um, just uh, not taking any parameters. I like to, when I'm first writing these functions, go ahead and include the parameters that are going to be there. Uh, and then we can see that they're not being used and they can always be removed later. I don't know what kind of overhead we're talking about for this. Ario has typed some stuff. And that's pretty awesome. Fiber optic cable, awesome. Okay, well, excellent. It sounds like it's probably not your internet connection specifically. Um, it is very strange that you are having disconnect issues. Our internet is also pretty solid here. And like I said, it very rarely do I get disconnected unless my machine's acting up or you know, the server's going down for maintenance or something like that. Then yeah, they, they <laughs> you get disconnected if you're still online when that happens. Um, ah, geez. Unfortunately, yeah, I don't have any better ideas. Hopefully, you, if you, um, hopefully you've had a chance to check out the Lotro forums and see if anyone else has had a similar problem. Um, but if you haven't done that, um, give it give it a shot. See if anyone's had something similar, has us some ideas. And if they haven't, yeah, you could go ahead and post your own and say, here's the thing I get. I get it really awesome, often, like five times a day, however, what, however often you see it. Uh, and maybe the, the wider community, someone out there has had this and has some thoughts of, oh, it's only happened when I was using VPN or, oh, it only happened when the stars were aligned, whatever. Uh, but sadly, I don't have anything better than that to suggest. So hopefully that's something. Oh, you heard it could be related to your router that you use. Ooh, um, that's exciting. Because uh, those things are expensive to replace. Um, that being said, yeah, nothing really comes to mind. Like depending on your setup, you might be able to run like a dedicated line straight from the wall to to your machine instead of the router. But you know, you're probably using a router because you need to route the. You need to have multiple cables, so that's not very helpful. Now. Some routers have a quality of service uh, capability where they can kind of downgrade certain types of network traffic and upgrade, um, you know, and prioritize other types of network traffic. Uh, so I guess that's the other thing that would come to mind is, do you have QoS enabled? And if so, um, does 
Lotro use a, some non-standard port where it's like, ah, oh, you're not in important traffic. And also, are you doing things like streaming 4K videos or something at the same time where your router would be like, oh, yeah, we're definitely going to serve this video traffic. That's important. Uh, yeah, well, that's about it. Um, so let's go back to here. Now, here's what the two differences would look like. We can either call uh, make checkbox, passing the things that we care about, and they don't all have to be on different lines, but I find it very readable this way. Parent, the text, um, the Y, uh, the initial value, and the function that should be called when it changes, versus having to remember to do all these things in the first place. And if you miss one of them, then something goes awry. So I'm gonna say, let's go ahead and give that a try and see what happens. Awesome, we have a, <laughs> we have a syntax here, 182. So, attempt to index local self. Oh, of course. Um, no, not of course. What did I do? Indicate. Let's give that a sec. All right, well, unfortunately, none of that was helpful for Ario. Good luck. Uh, maybe consider checking out the forums. Uh, hey, Garth, one bit sick thing you could try. Uh, GLS.loach.com in your browser. It should redirect you to the SSG help site. It's the same name the client uses to access the game, so it's basically a basic connectivity test. Ping and uh, trace route aren't a good tests, by the way. Um, cool, thanks for jumping in there, Agatha. I had if I ever knew about gls.locher.com, I have forgotten. Okay, so did I do something weird here? Make checkbox self self is already valid. We know that. One eighty two attempt to index local. Self. All right, what's going on in line 182? Well, it's the function definition, which is weird to me. What have I done wrong? I'm drawing a blank. I have the right number of parentheses. <laughs> I'm using a colon, but it is a class function. What is going on here? Okay, back up a sec. Hold my horses. Let's go ahead and comment out the new code. Reload. Everything works great. Awesome. Well, let's just call that uh, function with nothing. See what happens. That's fine. Okay. Okay. I have stumbled into a problem. What's going on? Unexpected symbol. All right, but why is it unexpected? All right, well, we'll just remove this. Oh, of course, that comma is not valid if it's the only thing in the list. I feel like with all the other loosey goosiness that Lua does for syntax, you could just ignore trailing commas. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Okay, that didn't break it. Remember to get rid of that trailing comma. Let's go ahead and load this up. And don't forget, there is a 100 Lotro point giveaway currently active. If you haven't entered, go ahead and type exclamation point giveaway. Okay, it wasn't that. Let's do another line.
Okay. Ah, of course. I do believe I messed up this call right here. Okay, that was driving me bonkers because the error message was dying in the correct place, the function instantiation, but it wasn't uh, um, giving me a useful error message. So let's go ahead and unload and reload and then we can replicate the problem so we can all learn from my mistake. Okay, so in Lua, you have two different ways to declare a function uh, call. You can either use colon syntax or dot syntax. If you use a uh, colon syntax, then there's an implicit self that's gonna be passed along, which is the settings object. And so when we do this uh, git show melodic interlude, uh, we're going to have access to a self variable that's sort of a hidden variable right here. Uh, and it's just a, a nice way for us to not have to pass it as the first parameter. The other option is to go ahead and just do uh, self.settings, uh, passing that explicitly as the first parameter, and then you use the dot notation that says don't go ahead and uh, add in that self parameter. And then on the receiving side, you would go ahead and declare self as the first parameter, and you receive it on in. It's a pain in the butt. So we don't do that. But if you mix up your conventions and do a dot instead of a colon and your function uses self, then that self hasn't been populated. It's nil, you have a nil uh, reference, and it's terrible. And we can see that the error message died at line 182. Really? 182? Hang on. Sure. Oh, it's I. Oh. Oh, I can't believe I missed that. It was dying at uh, the line that was basically identical to the function I thought I was calling, and I didn't even notice it was the wrong uh, file. That's, uh, that's sad. It was trying to help me this whole time. It was giving me the error message, I assume. Yeah, it was settings 182. But because the function I was trying to call was line 183, I just I saw what I wanted to see or thought was correct. That was a mistake. Okay, so coming back in here, my goodness, we're gonna go ahead and reload Mr. Buffs. Uh, and we can see that dot notation is still throwing that error. And so we're gonna go ahead and reload with a colon notation and everything's great. One, one little dot can just break you. And so if I go ahead and do a show melodic interlude window, Cool, we've got an error now. Let's uh, take a look. So we can see option window, correct file this time, uh, line 238. Attempt to index field show metallic interlude checkbox a uh, nil value. Oh, show melodic, I should say. Okay, did we remember to return checkbox from the, the factory function? We did not. That is gonna be a problem. Let's go ahead and return that object so that we're not setting a nil uh, value to this checkbox. Okay, so coming back into the options, check that box, excellent. So we can see start, stop, unchecked, start, everything's working as expected. So I guess it's a question of uh, personal preference. For me, a factory function can be nice versus uh, just hopefully you remember to do all of these lines. Uh, but a function with five parameters is starting to get kind of unwieldy. Uh, and if you needed more things in your factory function, it would be even worse. Now, other thing you could do is have a uh, more modern style factory function where it's more like, you know, uh, set parent dot set y dot set uh, initial value dot whatever and you chain these function calls to uh, have a more fluent way of expressing the construction of this object. Uh, I'm sure we can make that work in, uh, in Lua, but 
No, we could. It would it would look like it would look but set parent doesn't return anything, does it? Yeah, so I'm not sure we can make that work. But that's that's where what you'll see in more uh, modern language uh, uh, systems that are using that fluent construction approach. Uh, yeah, like I, yeah. So I'm of a mixed minds. Like this block of text feels ugly, but you can't really get away uh, get around it very easily. You need to know uh, where you're parenting this thing, or just use a global variable, I guess. You need to know what the title is going to be. And based on the title, because of the way this plugin is set up, you need to know what the initial value and the set values are. But as I mentioned before, in the settings, I would very much like to have just a get value and name uh, and set value of name and value. Uh, and that means you could use that same value as the key for your lang. And suddenly your lang is, uh, underscore lang dot options dot or not dot uh, and that's just indexed by the name and so with a name you have this but also you have this and also you have this and suddenly uh, it's just a lot more streamlined for that constructor now you just maybe need three things <sighs> okay that was interesting um, that was a little bit of a, a diversion I wanted to see just how bad this was and I think the answer is this needs to wait until after the settings has received some refactor love. So let's not make my window disappear. Let's go to the to-do file and let's go ahead and say once this is done and get uh, slash set can be uh, indexed based on the name in lang.options then uh, we can extract that checkbox creation to a helper function. I think that's the right order to do this. Otherwise this just doesn't feel that much better than this. Maybe a little less fragile. It's going to be harder to uh, well I said harder. It, it would hopefully you wouldn't miss anything in this function call, but Lua doesn't care. If you pass four things and Lua wants five, it'll just be like, oh, you don't want a callback function. Oh, well. <laughs> ah, little redhead had put, reminded in chat. If you haven't entered the giveaway, go ahead and do exclamation point giveaway for one a chance at 100 Lutro points. Anavello says, couldn't you set up a structure containing all the options and then use a single builder function to loop and construct the options? Maybe a structure array helps with readability. Absolutely. And this is the part where I have done similar things in other places. Let's go ahead and pull that up, actually. Or which one am I thinking of? Where did I do this? I might have done it in the deep tracker. Let's uh, take a look real fast. So in documents. We're looking at Lord of the Rings Online, uh, and we're looking at plugins, and let's see if it was in a D tracker. Okay, yes, and so. That's, uh, that's what's going on here is uh, I passed an option name and that was the index into the options for the string that was going to go into the checkbox. But it was also the parameter you would pass to the load the value uh, or you would index into the settings array. And it's also how you would save the thing. Uh, and so ultimately the add option function uh, was the parent, the why, the thing, and then a couple of other stuff apparently. What was going on there? Oh, is is it a server or um, or an account setting, and then the callback. So yeah, but boil it down to a few uh, uh, fewer entries. Ah, excellent. Ginger has been drawn. Ginger, if you're here, go ahead and pop something into chat. Little redhead will send you your code for 100 Lotro points. 
Congratulations, and a very happy one year anniversary to the Plugging Along stream here on the Lotro stream at Twitch. Okay, so yes, that's what I was thinking of. I have done something like this where you can unify the options and the text and whatnot with a single uh, parameter, and it just makes me a little bit happier than what we've seen here in the settings, but little baby steps. Awesome, Jinjaru is here. That'll be the last Lotro Point giveaway of the evening. We've only got a, about 20 minutes left on the official Fish. timeline here. Uh, and I might uh, do some more next week. Uh, I think I've got a few more codes and it'll just be maybe a month of celebration or a couple weeks of celebration. We'll call it a combined anniversary slash midsummer festival uh, shindig maybe. Okay, I don't think this is so impressive that it needs to be kept, so one of the neat things about using source control is we can come in and say, you know what? No, I don't want that. So we can just discard our changes. There was nothing so remarkable in there that we need to save it. We could also stash those changes so we could refer to them later, but that was a pretty formulaic uh, extraction of code there. So we're good. Uh, that code never existed. Our melodic interlude checkbox is just the same block of code. Fun. Unload, reload, everything's back. Okay, so um, let's come back into our to-do file. We've gone ahead and said that's a later problem here. Um, so Um, add a setting to control melodic interlude window pops up. Done. I had to raise the spirit to court of salvation. You know, I got so distracted with the other stuff, which is good stuff to do, that now I've got 20 minutes to, to kind of noodle on, can I figure out how to get uh, a skill into user interface? Because I stumbled on this at the end of last time, and I've done no research in the intervening time to figure that one out. Uh, it's been a busy week. Um, but my golly, simplifying the setting system is really calling to me right now. Oh, do I want to think about that? I might. Uh, everything is set here. Let's see, two updates. Let's go ahead and commit that file. And what's going on with these things? Those were just some source data. I don't want to lose that, actually. So let's go ahead. I know this week isn't going to be any less busy. Let's go ahead and go into Lord of Rings Online. Um, let's go into Plugins, uh, Minstrel Buffs, and we're going to go ahead and make a new folder. And this is just going to be Source Files. And this is just one of those um, helper folders where I can store notes and information in Source Control but then when I see that, it's like, oh yeah, that doesn't need to go out uh, to the general public. So we can go ahead and move freedom and melodic interlude, uh, the things that we've seen in text uh, triggering, and also the image. We'll just move that into source files. Okay, so these were the, um, the tool tips from both freedom, the trait that allows you to trigger melodic interlude, and then the effect of melodic interlude. I thought that was really handy because well, freedom, you can hover over that anytime. Melodic interlude, that's like a 10% chance of triggering on some of your abilities. So we're gonna save that. And then um, here are the skills that happened just before I saw a melodic interlude. Awesome. Ginger says, nap time. Well, thanks for stopping by. All right, so added some reference information for melodic interlude. Great. It'll stop popping up in my, hey, you've got changes window, but I, I don't have to lose that. Okay, send that on out. So what do we have here? We have 15 minutes left. Let's look at the uh, settings, because that settings has just bothered me. Okay. So, in the language file, 
I want to pull that up here. Oh, I'm sorry, not the language. Um, in the lang file, so that would be strings. In options, we had these four options. We also had only visible in combat. I'm a little curious where that is. Only visible in combat. Oh, uh, why are you liking out here? Really wanted to check. Okay. Ah, I see. That isn't localized. Oh, well, that's fun. Well, while I'm thinking about it, let's hoist that out. Only visible in combat equals, and then we can hoist out that value. This will make it possible to localize that name. Apparently, I copied the whole line, not just the text I wanted. So uh, that'll make it possible for someone to come by and translate that for German or French. Awesome. And then we do need to remember to use it. So that's going to be a lang dot options dot um, only visible in combat, I think. Oh. Okay, so it looks like I spelled that correctly. But we do want to remember to, to copy over that uh, change to the other string files. Only visible in combat dot, uh, German, only visible in combat French. Okay. So, what else do we have? That was the options, okay. There's also the theme. The theme's a little bit harder, but we do have, up oh, select theme. So let's come back in and call that selected theme. And what did we call? Select theme colon, yeah, sure. And I closed those other language files too fast. Let's go ahead and paste in those default English phrases. Okay, so same thing. We can come in here and use the lang options selected theme to hoist out that uh, hard-coded string. And now that can be translated to German or French. Now, the theme one is going to be a tricky one, because that is the one where... How are we saving that? Set theme index. Okay, let's go ahead and check that out. Set theme index. We're setting, we're saving to theme index. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think this is doable. Do we have a git theme index? We do. Setting table theme index. Okay, yeah. I, I feel like this is doable. So, step number one. We do not want to break existing save files. And so that settings table theme index, pretty sure that's what goes into the save file. But I don't have to be sure. We can double check. Let's come back in to our uh, Lord of the Rings online plugin data and just come on over to my Affidel Minster Buff plugins file. This is going to be in a random order. Remember, Lua table tables don't serialize in any predictable order. But we can see that that theme index uh, has a one-to-one -one correlation here. Same thing for, um, let's see, 
Where did we put them? Ah, show melodic interlude. There we go. Um, show war speech timers. Show war speech. Really? War. Maybe I need to uh, actually populate the thing. There we go. Show war speech timers. Excellent. Uh, and so these settings table entries are the reference uh, we're going to see in the file. Okay. Excellent. Well, that means if we also use that in two other places, one, a lookup table for callback functions, we'll need to create that, but also the strings entries here. If instead of selected theme, this was theme. Theme index, then we could use that same string uh, to go in both places. I'm not sure I'm happy with the name theme index, but what's done is done. Okay. So if it looked like this, theme index, um, same thing with the only visible in combat. Let's see, visible. Effect window only visible in combat. Yeah, OK. That's pretty reasonable. Um, use soliloquy tracker. OK. Soliloquy window used. Yeah. Check for serious business. Serious business. OK. Show war speech timers. And show melodic interlude. So this is what would happen if we used the settings uh, table entry for the language entries as well. Now, this is, this is why I feel like uh, the settings table Again, waving a magic wand, going back to when it first came out. These maybe are not what I would have put into the file in the first place. But it, it's there. It's fine. No one ever looks at it for the most part. Uh, and so if we use the same values to index into an options here, which I think is fine. It's explicitly options. Um, cool. Yeah. So the other thing, of course, is we need to find those places in code that are using these and update them. And so that's one of the reasons we have source control here. We can come into strings and we're looking for uh, effect window only visible in combat. We uh, have only used that in one place so far. So let's come back in. Only visible in combat. Let's find all the uses of that. That needs to be effect window invisible. OK. This one we can update. And then finally here. Now, will that still work? Probably. Uh, no special characters. Let's take a look. Only visible in combat. Excellent. Okay, he says, more plug and magic happening. Yes, welcome. Uh, right now, I'm trying to improve how the Minstrel Buffs options, just sort of running out the clock here and uh, for the next uh, few minutes, I'm trying to update how uh, the options are done. Because every time we add another option to this window, we have to add more functions and more code to make it work. And I've, I've uh, wanted to do something about that for a little while. Today I added another option and it just I, something in me snapped. So here we are. We're going to go ahead and check out this selected theme. Uh, we're going to go ahead and find all the uses of selected theme. And we want to replace that with theme index. So come back in. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, in the options window, that's going to be lambda-options.theme index. Awesome. So what's next? Use Soliloquy Tracker. We want to replace that with Soliloquy Window Used. Super easy. But not in that file. That file needs to go away. All right, so we have in the German, in the French, and finally, I feel like that strings combined needs to go away. All right. Finally, we're actually using it here in the construction of this checkbox. Super easy. All right, check for serious business. We're going to do the same thing. It's going to go to check for serious business, but you know, not all caps. All right, next one. That's going to be show war speech timers. Now, this is, this is a, not a bad time to do this kind of refactoring. There's just enough here to kind of justify it, but not so much that I'm doing this to 20 different settings uh, kind of manually. Uh, and maybe there are better ways to make this happen, but it's kind of satisfying to see this uh, change one at a time. So uh, the final one, show melodic interlude, is just going to be camel cased instead. Excellent. So that's updated the strings entry uh, for the things being displayed. And that means if we unload and reload, we should see all these, most of these, working again. What's up with that? All right, show melodic interlude, yes. Show melodic interlude. Show melodic interlude. And in up, oh, I didn't actually save the options window. That will uh, put a damper on this. There we go, show melodic into the window. So that is excellent, but it's just a start. It's just a, a little bit of a tidying up. The other thing we want is we want to go ahead and make a, um, a helper function that we can start using instead of all these return self dot whatevers, uh, self dot setting tables. So let's kind of like get a sense of where are these being used. Awesome. All right, so function uh, settings get setting, uh, setting name. So that'll be a helper function. And we're gonna go ahead and return self.settingTable uh, indexed by setting name. Awesome. So that place that uses get effect window only visible in combat. Let's go ahead and just replace that with a setting get uh, setting. Oops, get setting. And that's going to be this. Ah, Ryan Dwarf says, I was referred to this stream. Well, welcome, Randwarf. Uh, here we talk about plugins, both the creation of plugins by code, and also if you happen to have any questions about plugins or uh, are struggling to get one to get installed, I can probably help you with that as well. So what's on your mind? And bear in mind that on today's stream, we officially have two more minutes. I don't mind staying a little late, uh, but also I'll be back next Tuesday, probably. I don't think I'm gonna be anywhere strange, uh, but I'm here most every Tuesday. Okay, so we had uh, this function, so we can go get settings, or get setting, I should say. I, should, I guess I should check, is it get setting or get settings? Excellent, I called it get setting. 
And the final place that we used that was here itself. So if we do a search, we should not see that anywhere else. Let's kill that function, you know, gently. Uh, and that was the effect window only visible in combat settings. So if we go ahead and unload and reload and come back in here and check the box, only visible in combat, uncheck. Now that's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it will also become visible if you have something displayed on it. So for instance, these ballads uh, that were activated by my cry of the chorus, uh, that causes the window to also be visible. All right, no response from Ryan Dwarf there. If you're typing, uh, feel free to hit enter and do a part two. Uh, if you're not, that's okay too. All right, so we have a get setting generic function. Now, what would a settings uh, set um, setting look like? So that's gonna be a setting name and a setting value which makes a lot of sense. We're dealing with tables that are essentially key value pairs. <laughs> right or says, sorry, my Twitch keeps acting up. I'll be right back. All right, uh, no worries. Okay, so what would a set setting look like? Well, um, a couple of things. We have self.settingTable of the thing, so setting name, equals setting value, awesome. We have a self colon save. So anytime a setting is changed, uh, this plugin writes that out to a uh, the file right away. It doesn't wait until you log off. Okay. And we also have if, um, now it's looking for a variable. What we want is looking it to see if a table has an entry. So instead of having all of these callbacks, let's go ahead and say self dot setting changed equals a table. And so this would be, you know, self dot uh, setting, uh, setting changed. And that would be, oh, let's have an op, uh, Go ahead, um, so like theme index. Um, uh, theme index equals function uh, do stuff end. So something like that. Uh, this is how someone would uh, could set that callback. But we don't actually need uh, other people to set that callback. We want that to be a function. Oops, I've scrolled down too far. So where did I put these things? Get setting, set seven, yes. Function, uh, settings, um, assign callback. So we have setting name and um, callback. Super easy. And this is where, and we can see an example of this for the effect window only visible in combat changed. Bit of a mouthful. Here, self.settings.thatThing equals, we want to replace that with a call to this function. So, used to be. Ah, Rydorf says, refresh seems to have worked. What's on your mind? All right, so we're going to assign a callback, and that's going to look like self.settings table. Wait, no, self.callbacks. What did I call this thing? <laughs> Just a moment. Uh, I called it settings changed. Okay. So self.settings changed. And we're going to do settings name equals callback. Super easy. And then in the uh, in the save setting function, we can go ahead and say if uh, self dot settings changed uh, and setting name does not equal nil, 
And we can also check to see if the type is correct. Um, what is it? And type of self dot settings settings changed. Setting name uh, equals function. So if it's not null and do I have too many parentheses? Yeah, I don't have a then. So we have uh, if the thing exists and it's a function, then we can just go ahead and call it. So we can say self.setting uh, changed, setting name, and call it uh, as if it's a function, because it is. So there we go. We have a generic set setting that acts just like the hard-coded and copy-pasted version where we are setting a value into a table based off the name, but we're also saving. And then finally, uh, if the thing is, uh, if we have a callback, then go ahead and use it. Real has said something in chat, possibly in response to Reindorf. Um, I am not sure what that means. But hopefully it's helpful. Okay, so we have um, a question here. Why are we uh, grabbing the value of this thing three times? I think it'd be local callback equals, and again, this is kind of, kind of a potential callback, but callback's a little bit easier. And then if callback is not nil, and if the type of callback equals function, then callback, um, and that is all. Uh, and then that's short enough where we can make a one-liner out, uh, out of this if statement. So if callback is not nil, and the type of callback, oops, need to close on that function, um, type of callback equals function, then we're going to call callback. That seems like it's uh, plausible. Okay, so let's try changing. Um, and again, we'll just change that uh, set effective window uh, only invisible. And we'll also need to assign that callback. So let's first find that callback in use. And we're going to change it to settings assign callback. OK, so that's going to look like self.settings assign callback. And that's going to be whatever this was, theme no, uh, effect window only visible in combat. OK. And the function was this function. It's a bit long for my taste, but we'll just uh, see what we can do with that. OK, we have the use of that. Oh, interesting. We don't have the use of that. OK. But we have this. So let's go ahead and do a search for dot that. OK, so we're going to get uh, get rid of that uh, variable. It was used here. OK. Uh, let's see, where else do we have that? And it's being used in this function. Excellent. So now let's go ahead and convert this function over. Let's find any uses of that. We have it in the option window. We're going to go ahead and instead do self.settings set. Um, what did I call it? Set setting. OK. <laughs> and then we need the name of that setting. Oh, that's pretty easy. And the value of that setting. And that's going to be this self combat visible checked is checked. Now, that's getting a little long. Uh, we, we can also make it a little bit easier to read if we just do each um, parameter on its own line like this. Cool. So we have um, removed all of the calls of this function and replaced it with the generic version of it. 
And our refactoring is going to be kind of like that for each one of these. Uh, convert the calls to a specifically named get soliloquy window used function to the get setting function. Uh, and eventually, if we're already calling settings, we could maybe call it settings get and settings set. But for now, you know, it's fine. Get setting, set setting. Good enough. So we have our generic uh, helper functions. Exactly, little redhead. We've removed the specific calls and replaced them with generics. Let's see if they notice. Oh, and we didn't actually check to see if they noticed. So let's come in into options, only visible. OK. So each time I check this, it, it is working. If I check it and unload and reload, we can see. Excellent. Uh, unload, reload it is back to being unchecked. So it seems to be working. What is my goose doing? OK. So it's our generic helper functions for get setting, set setting, and assign callback. Now, settings changed. We're using that. Who are we? Uh, we're just using it in the save. OK. I was, I was just thinking, if we're using it outside, we could maybe have a trigger callback function. Here's the name, and it just runs it. Um, but if we're only using it here, uh, then, oh, I still kind of want it. Function, settings, uh, and then we can say trigger callback. And that's the setting name. But the, uh, um, um, this is going to look identical to the code that is already in our set settings, where we use the setting name to get a callback. We check to see if it's not null, and if it's not, we check to see if it's a function. And then we try to uh, execute it as if it's a function. But that means we can do a self colon trigger callback with the setting name and get rid of all this. So now our save has been boiled down to um, put the thing into the table, save, and trigger the callback. Now, we could maybe improve this callback and assume that it will take a parameter with the new value. That might not be a, a terrible thing. Um, but right now, none of the other functions make use of that. Uh, kind of curious. What does that look like? Uh, in the option window, we have updated the combat visibility, I think. Yep, get setting um, when the check is changed. Oh, no, we did it differently. OK, yeah. Um, self settings set to the value of that checked. Yeah, that all makes sense. OK, um, just thinking here. Also, the way, unfortunately, the way this settings object is constructed, it's uh, tr uh, messing up the syntax of the, the IntelliSense highlighter, which is just like, I have no idea what's in this thing. Um, and I, I feel like there's ways to fix that. But right now, uh, the, the IntelliSense is messing up with the settings. Um, OK. So we have events. And these are our events to be removed. OK. Now, on the one hand, this is kind of overkill. We only have five or six settings here that we care about. On the other hand, uh, making it simpler to add more options is very nice. Uh, what comes to mind is Titan Bar. Titan Bar is quite appropriately a Titan. And doing something like adding a new currency involves following a reference guide involving the changing of half a dozen different files and copy pasting and tweaking this little thing and doing this other thing. And it really feels like sometime a while ago, they should have gone through this process of saying, OK, let's refactor this. So adding a new currency is adding an entry to this list. Done. Uh, or maybe these two lists. You know. 
Ad adding a couple entries here, one file, very simple. But because that never happened, now it's at a point where if I want to do that, I am looking at, you know, that's, that's a weekend right there, right? Like, that's taking all the time to figure out, okay, can it be done? How are we going to do it? What is this going to look like? Um, and, you know, there's dozens of currencies in Titanvar. Let's see, you're affecting a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, on the one hand, this is overkill for where we are. But on the other hand, uh, if you don't do it, <laughs> at some point you'll look back and say, man, I wish I had done that. Maybe. But that's, of course, the problem. We never know how far, you know, is this thing going to be around for another five or ten years? Is it going to have dozens of options? Or uh, is everyone going to stop using it tomorrow? You never know. Uh, and that's why you just don't bother with the heavy lifting until you it starts becoming a drag. And it started becoming a drag to me, adding a setting. It's like, oh, i got to do all this stuff. So there we are. Don't pre prematurely do it. But do it before it gets to be too onerous. All right. Well, we're a uh, quarter past the hour here, so this is uh, definitely a good place to pause. The plugin is working, which is great for me because I use this uh, regularly. Uh, and let me uh, let me update this to do file. So um, let's go ahead and move this up. I think this is. I mean, it's it's one of those. So there's there's this concept. Uh, um, I think uh, Raymond Chen, a blogger at Microsoft, was talking about this. The concept of paying your developer taxes, you know, playing nice with multi-threaded systems or or whatnot. Um, you know, eventually you you need to uh, do some some infrastructure stuff. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, simplifying the settings system might just be a version of that, uh, or technological debt would be another thing. We've, we've skated by it for a while, just shoving them all into a corner and hoping no one notices, and now it's time to clean up the mess. Okay, so we're going to simplify the settings, and I think that's a great thing to go ahead and just finish up next time. We've seen how it's going to work, so we'll just do that really fast on the first half, and then move on to more improvements. So, this is all under the cover stuff, just make life easier for me or any future maintainer. Alright, so we've got our to-do file there. Uh, excellent. So go ahead and throw any last minute questions, comments, concerns, whatnot into chat. I'm going to get a drink, uh, look around, and if there's nothing too urgent, we'll go ahead and call it there. All right, no one has jumped in with a, wait, I have an urgent question. So that is all we are going to cover today. Thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of Lotro plugins. Uh, I do hope to see you again next week. And until then, keep plugging along. All right, bye-bye now.